Um, just to say hey, uh, hey again to everyone who's just joined us. Um, welcome to uh, our first retail success webinar from Vend. Uh, we're really excited to be able to do this because uh, what we found is our, our retailers are doing great business out there, but they're always looking for ways to do even better uh, work and, uh, and looking for tips and advice to grow their stores. And that's something we want to be helping with. Uh, so the retail success series, which will be going on into the future, will be about bringing together uh, the really good thinkers and uh, doers from the retail industry and uh, having them share their knowledge of retail uh, with the, our event customers. Uh, today, we've got Nicole Riley, who's um, the founder of RetailMinded.com and a Forbes contributor on uh, subjects uh, retail and small business. Uh, she's also the author of Retail 101. Uh, it's a really cool little book uh, that's available on Amazon right now, uh, The Guide to Managing and Marketing a Retail Business. Um, we'll also be giving away a copy of that book to the best question uh, for the Q&A session right at the end of this webinar. Um, just send that through to either webinar at vendhq.com or uh, in the questions box in the control panel or by tweeting us uh, with the hashtag retail success. Um, what I'll do now is just hand it over to Nicole and uh, we'll get things going. Uh, you, you good to go, Nicole? I am. I'm great. Can cool. You hear me? I think we're all good. If good. anyone has any, sorry, if anyone has any problems, just uh, feel free to email through to webinar at and uh, we'll try to get you sorted as quickly as possible. Um, don't worry if you can't quite get everything in. Uh, what we'll do is we'll be uh, emailing the recorded webinar to everyone who's registered here uh, a couple of days after today's uh, webinar finishes. So that's cool. Just sending this over to you now, Nicole. Great. Show my screen. Can you see it? Yes, we can. Perfect. Okay. Great. Well, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. I'm just trying to minimize this little guy here, and then we'll get going. Let's see. There we go. So I'm super excited to talk to you guys because I'm very passionate about retail. And what I want to do is dive right in. So you guys are busy, and one of the worst things that retailers have on their plate is the fact that there's never an ending of your to-do list. So one of the best habits that you can start to instill in your business is to prioritize your schedule. Um, easier said than done, but I think what's really key here is to schedule what is necessary and eliminate what is not. And so sometimes it's as simple as saying, hey, I love the merchandise. It's my favorite part of retail. And you might find yourself spending more and more time merchandising. It looks fantastic, but meanwhile, there's other parts of the business that are neglected. So what's really key for retailers who are successful is to actually schedule time and manage their time efficiently so that they can get done what's necessary and eliminate that extra stuff that's simply not always on key for what they need to do for their store. The next point is to participate in industry events. Now, again, we know you're busy and there's a lot to do, but leaving your store is actually going, to, actually going to bring you a lot of great benefit to your business. There's a lot of ways you can do this. I love trade shows. I'm a big believer that you've got to go into trade shows. You're connecting with vendors. You're building relationships. You're literally in the middle of hearing what's coming up within your industry trend. You're learning because there's typically learning opportunities as well. So take the time to participate in those. Locally, there's probably a lot going on within your own communities or possibly the opportunity for you to start some business groups, um, even let's say you have a store that caters to a certain niche area, whether it's a bike shop or a gardening store, getting engaged with the groups and organizations that might have a certain niche audience as well is a great way to not only help promote your store, but also learn about what your customer's up to. Your local chamber of commerces or your local small town groups, those are also very important to be engaged with. In general, there's a tremendous amount of education resources as well. You know, something like what you're doing right now, by the way, that's huge. It's fantastic that you've taken this time to come and learn because that alone is giving you guys success and saying, hey, I know I need to constantly engage and learn and seek and 
put more into my knowledge to run my store more successfully. So attending events that are educational, whether they're online or offline. And then I also encourage people to participate in the industry movement of buying local or shop small. Um, for example, Small Business Saturday is the Saturday that follows Thanksgiving in the United States every year. This is a movement that is becoming more recognized and globally visible. It's something that not only retailers should participate in, but consumers are actually wanting to get engaged with. So I encourage retailers, and I've seen those who are successful, becoming engaged in these types of activities. So at the bottom here, you see I have a few logos, and these are just an example. So you have an educational conference, which is the independent report conference. You have an example of a trade show. Here I am referencing the ASD show because it's the, the world's largest just general consumer show. Um, City of Geneva, Illinois, that's actually our home base right now for Retail Minded. They do a great job supporting their local merchants. And wherever you are, I would hope that you can lean on someone within the community of your local hometown who does that as well. And then simply your buy local campaign, whether, whether it's a local local campaign or a national movement. But the key is to get involved. The next tip here is network socially. That includes social media and face-to-face. -face. So successful retailers are constantly saying that they need to give that face time and that social experience beyond their actual store. So this means going to professional events, the ones we just spoke about, but also personal events. Because as I've always believed, if you run your own store, you truly live a retail life. It's more than just a job. It's a total lifestyle being a retail business owner. And so your personal life does overlap. And while some people want to believe you can turn it on and off, the reality is, is that if you own your own retail store, it's with you all the time. And so at any opportunity, you have the chance to promote your business. And of course, you don't have to be you know, so salesy that it's uncomfortable to be around, but rather you can simply be complimentary to what it is your store does, encourage people to come visit, um, offer ideas on upcoming events you may have, Successful retailers know how to constantly reference their business without making it seem like a direct sales pitch. And again, you can do this online or offline. The next habit of successful retailers that I see again and again over the years is that those who have had success and kept success, they move forward in their actions. They're never looking behind. In other words, they're accepting the mistakes that they've made. They're learning from the past and they're looking ahead. So what does this really mean? For example, let's say you invest $1,000 in inventory and that inventory is simply not selling. Rather than dwell on that and hope to believe it's going to sell, use the data that you've acknowledged that it's not selling and mark it down and move on. Of course, there's a lot of strategy with that. You can't simply say, okay, I'm gonna slash it in half. Instead, what you want to do is identify that, okay, I'm going to create a plan for this and we're going to move forward and we're going to accept that this wasn't for our customer. Another thing I tell retailers to do, and I know many successful, successful retailers who have done this, they actually become friends with retailers in other parts of the world or their country or their state, and what's not selling for them might be for their friend retailer, and they actually buy off inventory from each other. So it's a creative way to say, okay, I made a mistake, it's not going to ruin me though, it's certainly not going to break my month, I need to move forward. So no matter what the mistakes are from your past, look ahead, because by looking ahead, you're able to move forward and hopefully gain more strength in your business. The next habit that successful retailers instill is that they surround themselves with smart or smarter people even. Okay, so what does this mean? When you hire people, you want to hire people who complement what your weaknesses might be. You want to be a team player in everything that you do because even if you are the store owner or the store manager, you need to recognize that the people who work with you are also the faces of your brand and business. So you want to make sure they're the best that they can be. You want to also acknowledge your own weaknesses. For example, if you are not good at visual displays, if you have to hire someone for any reason, looking for attributes within their strengths might include somebody who's good at visual display. Because as a small retail business owner, we know that you don't have an entire staff of people 
to fill every single category of retail, marketing, merchandising, inventory. There's so many different things. But what you want to do is make sure that you're covering what your weaknesses are to bring a better balance to your store. And again, be a team player. Give props where it's deserved. Let the people who are doing well know they're doing well. Essentially, you want to hire smart. And beyond your actual storefront, take the time to learn from others who you believe can teach you something as well. So the next habit that smart retailers often have is that they're reviewing the industry news, data, trends, and competition. Because as a retailer, you guys know more than anybody, you're extremely busy. So it's hard to always keep up. But I like to reference this as our retail realities, okay? So a retail reality might mean that there is a neighbor down the street in your local Main Street shopping area that has opened a new store that's a direct competitor to you. If that's your retail reality, you can't ignore that or you can't assume that your customer isn't going to go there. Instead, you need to become very aware of what they're doing and apply that to your business strategy as well. You know, another retail reality is that customers do shop at big box stores. I worked with a great retailer recently out of um, the Queens, New York area in a neighborhood called Astoria. And she's been a retailer for over 10 years. The store is called Lockwood. It used to be called Site. She recently revamped it and did a whole new launch. But what she did was she actually bought her inventory knowing that her competition is Ikea, Crate and Barrel, Target, places that sell stuff for people's homes. And she's an urban store. So she realizes that while she can't carry the big furniture or even the small-scale furniture that some of her competition might, what she can do is sell fantastic accessories and acknowledge to her customer, oh, yeah, do you know that bookshelf that everyone seems to have from Ikea? And so she actually incorporates that into her strategy now for selling. And then she gives them offerings through her inventory that complement these other brands. What you want to do is stay aware of your realities acknowledge your competition, acknowledge what your customers are really doing, and be willing to change. The next habit of successful retailers is that they're doing just that. They're reacting to the customer change that we just spoke about. You want to make sure as a retailer you're not putting a barrier around yourself that ignores certain things. You know, among these things might include the fact that your customers age. You know, sometimes a community might start very young and urban, but those same people start to get married and start to have babies, and all of a sudden you have strollers being pushed through your neighborhood when years before you never did, or possibly your customers more mature and their style is shifting. Whatever it is, you want to make sure that you're recognizing my customers evolving, which means I need to as well. The other thing that happens is that demographics change within communities all the time. There's constantly a shift. I encourage you to work with your local city ordinance to gather the demographic data that you can to better understand who's in your direct area. And then, of course, neighborhood shift. What one neighborhood used to be isn't always what it is today. And if your store has not shifted or evolved with that, you're missing out on opportunity to gain sales. So successful retailers are constantly looking how Customers who are walking by their storefront every day are evolving and changing, and as a result, they're actually re evolving and changing as well. So the next habit of a successful retailer is that they take time off. I think it's so hard for retailers to do that sometimes because, again, your to-do list is so long and you are so busy, but it's so key to give yourself a little break. You want to let others take control sometimes, and this goes back to hiring smart. If you have a team around you that you trust, you're able to walk away from them and feel confident that they're going to be able to run and manage your store if you're not there. You need to step away from work. You truly need to relax. And this crosses over more than just with your individual self, but it often overlaps with your personal relationships, whether it's family, friends, and significant other. These details constantly overlap within all of our professional lives. But retailers who find success do so by actually walking away from their store sometimes. So I encourage you to do that as well. The other thing this is going to do is allow you to walk into your store when you come back from that little getaway and see things from a different perspective with a clear head, a more relaxed view, to take more control over what's going on and to move forward more effectively in your business. 
So the next habit here is to step outside your comfort zone. You want to embrace what scares you sometimes. A lot of retailers I talk to are scared about all the rapidly changing technology. Um, and what I tell them is incorporate it, use it. Technology today is a reality of retail. It's also a reality of consumers' own decisions. So as a merchant, it's important to let technology help you, okay? Technology delivers data. When you use a point of sale system, for example, like Ben, you actually have the opportunity to gain data from what it's doing for you. And not only is it helping streamline your actual efficiency of selling, but it actually gives you data for your inventory purchasing, often your customer loyalty. There's so many things that data can provide for you. You know, other companies also offer, you know, there's data which is crosses over into social media, online marketing. There's a tremendous amount of data at hand nowadays for small retailers. It used to be big box stores only had this. And what I tell retailers all the time is use this. Do not shy away from it. The further you walk away from it, the further behind your store is going to become. Remember, customers are evolving all the time, so you need to keep up, and data is going to help you. So whether it's data that scares you or anything else that scares you, embrace it and acknowledge it as a reality of retail. The next thing you want to do is let others help you. Successful retailers do such a great job at this. They realize that although it's their dream, they need others to lean on. So lean on professionals. Maybe it means you need an accountant to help keep your books. Maybe it means you need someone to come in to professionally merchandise your store. Possibly it means you need someone to come in simply to help with the actual cleaning of your store. So now we're looking simply at house, you know, store cleaning service. Whatever it is, you want to pay for select service support to help you effectively operate your business. What this will do is allow you to transition those additional hours into work that will be more effective for your business and ultimately your sales. It's also okay to ask for help. If you find yourself in a bind, make sure you're actually reaching out to people versus quietly trying to do this alone. A lot of local small business development centers, score centers, and various other community-based centers across the world, and specifically the U.S. I know has this, um, offer consult advice and different support for free. So you want to make sure that you are actually seeking additional support if you need it. And for all of us, we will at some point. So don't be shy about doing that. Successful retailers certainly aren't. And the bonus thing is to take time from you. So yes, even though you're going to take that vacation, what about your traditional work week? You want to make sure that you're giving time to yourself. Spend time with family, exercise, enjoy a day off. You want to live. Because owning your retail store is, for many of us, living a dream. And that dream does include more than just running your store day to day. You want to make sure you're enjoying the life around you. So I realize that's a lot really, really fast, but I want to make sure we have time for questions. And I would encourage you guys to share those, and hopefully we can chat a little bit more. Thank you, Nicole. Um, we do have a couple of questions in already. Um, and again, feel free to send them through by email, uh, webinar at vendhq.com or through the little questions box in the side of the GoToWebinar page or uh, on Twitter with the hashtag Retail Success. So um, uh, one of the questions I've gotten through here uh, is from Caitlin from Austin. Uh, we're talking about habits and uh, saving time. Um, something that Caitlin's doing a lot of is trying to manage her social media and blogging presence as well as running her uh, boutique store. And she's asking, um, are there any particular platforms that you see that retailers are doing better at than others? Because she's having a hard time uh, working on uh, across all of them uh, and thinks she might be uh, better spending her time on one or two or something like that. Is there something that you can maybe sure. line up with? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. I think social media is very, very key. And nowadays, you, you actually have the chance to sell directly from social media, like on Facebook or Instagram. There's a company called Soldsy that allows you to actually sell from those two platforms, which is key. Um, Sorry, could you um, repeat that? Uh, could you uh, spell that out? S-O-L? Yes, it's S-O-L-D-S-I-E. Cool. Dot com, I believe. And so now if you're on Facebook or Instagram, your time spent isn't just using social media. It's also social selling, and that's a new trend that's growing in retail. Um, I also encourage you, because it does take a lot of time, 
to actually, this is a great example of leaning on others. A company like Snap Retail can allow you to automate your social media. It still also gives you the chance to personalize it, but it streamlines your time involved and it opens up more time for you everywhere else. So you can link in Pinterest, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, for example. And maybe you've identified you only want two of those. If you were to do only two of those, and I would tell this to most retailers as well, certainly do Facebook and then Instagram or Pinterest are so visual, it's great for retailers. But Twitter is active in conversation. It's a little bit more content driven. So pick your favorite two that you feel meet your strengths. But I definitely think you need to be in two, ideally three of those spots. Cool. Thanks for that. Um, I've got another one from Kimberly from Toronto. Uh, Kimberly's store area had good foot traffic across it um, when she moved into the place, but it's uh, slowed down in the last couple of years. Is, is this something that she can do in terms of uh, community outreach or events or getting in touch with uh, maybe a chamber of commerce or something, something you'd recommend to help increase the foot traffic going through her area? Yeah, that's a great question, and this is one of those habits we briefly discussed on how locations change, neighborhoods change. What used to be, let's say, a more popular spot might not be anymore. It's really important at this point to work with your other existing and established businesses to come together and say, what are we going to do to draw attention to our community again? And it really is a team effort. It, it can't be done alone. Now, you can spearhead it, though and certainly go directly to your chamber or whatever local organization oversees that group. And I would suggest you to actually lean on an existing, either whether it's a buy local campaign um, or in the month of November, the Shop Small Saturday, you want to actually lean on existing campaigns because it's already there for you. So much of the marketing is done. But you want to create something and build it and generate local publicity. And once you guys have more of an action plan, then reach out to your local media, your local press, and reinvent this community so that consumers want to come back again. The key is to make sure they think they're coming back because there's a new reason to, not just because. So make it exciting. And work together again with those other local businesses. It's a group effort here. Cool. Um, you're talking a lot about data and the importance of um, having uh data sets to kind of make decisions. Um, uh, you mentioned city ordinances. Could you maybe give us a little bit more information about w what that is, maybe for people who don't quite know and maybe where to find them? Uh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Of course. So those of you in the U.S., every single state with exception to Wisconsin has a state-level retail organization, okay? So for example, let's pretend you're in North Carolina. North Carolina has an organization called North Carolina Retail Merchants Association, okay? And actually in Retail 101, the book, I provide a list of all of these organizations. You literally have the opportunity to identify at a state level a group that is fully committed to small independent retail businesses, okay? And, and some of them also work with big box stores, but they are also working with the independent retailer to help them in so many of their responsibilities from tax and legislation to publicity and consumer awareness. Now, if you break that down and hit a little bit closer to home, what happens is communities have chamber of commerces as well as cities. So when I say a city, I literally mean if you live in Toronto, Canada, Toronto itself has an economic director and a group that is focused on the economy of that town. Those groups and actual organizations often have people willing and wanting to work within, you know, with the small business owners within that community. So reach out to them to find out what they're doing and then how you can get involved. Because you might be surprised to find that there's a lot of benefits in doing so and ultimately more visibility for your business as well. Cool. Um, I've got time for another couple of questions, I think. Uh, here's one from Deborah Costa. Uh, what are some community events or ideas that you find would be most effective for driving business? And uh, what uh, methods have you used or seen retailers use successfully to market these events? Okay, that's a great question. Um, every community is different, but generally speaking, when the businesses work together, I see some great success. 
And one of the very popular things this time of year on our side of the world over here in the U.S. is that sidewalk sale where you're basically bringing your stores to the streets, okay? So now people want to be outside. They're not always navigating in and out of stores like they do during other seasons. So if you actually bring your store outside um, and you have a dedicated event for that, that's a fun way for consumers to still linger and have their cool drinks and also engage outside at the dining establishments, but they're surrounded by retail. That's a very fun way. The other thing I see is when people actually do some sort of um, almost like a loyalty punch card. So if, if you can imagine bar hopping, right? So you have bar hopping. That's just traditional pastime many people do. But it's like retail hopping, and I've seen great success with communities who might take a few like-minded stores. So for example, if you are a restaurant and maybe there's a little chocolate store in town and then there's a little bed and breakfast and then there's a wedding shop and there's a gift store and a floral boutique. These stores could come together and say, we're going to do an event specific to the brides to be. And they do it in the springtime because that's when um, there's a lot of proposals and weddings upcoming. And so suddenly they create an event. go to all these different stores and at each different store for their experience. So beyond just shopping, introduce music into your store for the day or introduce some sort of treats or drinks, a special appetizer, possibly have a caterer come in. These are things that small businesses often do without giving you an expense to it because it brings visibility for them as well. So bundling a store experience is also a great way to work together and create an event. Um, and you can do this at any time of year. You want to do something that makes sense for your business, of course. Um, so working with other businesses is huge. And then I feel from an individual perspective, if you're looking to have your store have a single event, you know, I always tell people, don't aim so high right away. Aim for two smaller events and see what the success is. And then maybe do your bigger events every other month or every third month even. But if you can capture a good crowd on a smaller scale a handful of times a month versus doing a huge event every month, you're likely to generate just as much, if not more, in sales, and your over overhead will often be less. I hope that helped. Oh, I think it very much did. Um, that was a great answer there. Um, I, I think we're coming to the end. It's uh, hitting up to the hour. So um, I just want to say thank you, Nicole, uh, for your time. And um, uh, and also just all those tips. Uh, what we'll do now is um, send, we'll send everybody a couple of the links that Nicole mentioned and a couple of the uh, topics, for instance, the uh, Soldzy for selling online through social media and some of the ideas about uh, reaching out to city ordinances and things like that. Uh, we'll send that through in an email and we'll also send a recording of today's webinar to you in your email so you can watch it or send it on to your uh, anyone in your store, staff that you want to see this webinar in the future. Um, so yeah, once again, thank you, Nicole. And um, uh, I highly recommend everybody check out Nicole's book. It's on Amazon right now, Retail 101, uh, The Guide to Marketing, uh, Managing and Marketing Your Retail Business. Um, and also check out retailminded.com, which is uh, Nicole's publication, uh, and it's online. Uh, and it's always got great tips there. Uh, like weekly we we all often share the links from retail minded uh on our social media channels and uh in our different newsletters so um thank you again nicole absolutely thank you guys cool um if anybody has any other questions or would like to get in touch with uh vend or nicole just send them through to webinar at vendhq.com and i'll uh, we'll get back to you as quickly as we can today um and thanks have a great day everyone Thank you. Bye-bye.